Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Computer Science Colloquium at RPI. This is the first one of the fall. Um, so Christian here is going to be talking about a computational lens on auction markets or budgets. He's coming from Columbia, um, and we're glad to have him talking today. So enjoy. And Christian, it's all you. All right. And are you still seeing the right yep. uh, presentation? Looking good. Okay, cool. So thank you for the introduction, and thank you, George and uh, Lirong and Alex for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Christian Kroer. I'm an assistant professor in the IOR department at Columbia University. Um, if anyone has any questions at any point in time, I guess feel free to speak up um, if you're able to. I've never presented on this platform before. Uh, or if anyone wants to interrupt me, that's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about a computational lens on auction markets or budgets. And so the setting that I'm interested in is the following. Okay, so we're interested in these auction market settings. And these are settings that are inspired by sort of the large scale advertising markets that are conducted by, uh, for example, Google and Facebook. Okay, and so in that setting, uh, is everyone else able to hear me? Somebody asked if I'm the only one that's. My audio good or? Yeah, I think you're good. I think the consensus okay. is just the okay. issue. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm somehow not able to open the chat while presenting, so I can't uh, see if anyone is saying anything, just FYI, uh, okay. except for the bubbles. I'll try okay. to relay any questions yep. that might come up. Sounds good. Okay, cool. So we're talking about these auction market settings. Okay. And in these settings, as you're well aware, it's something like, for example, uh, you search on Google or you open up your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, right? And you have some kind of user characteristics, such as, for example, gender or age or sports interests or whatever, right? And various advertisers are interested in advertising to certain types of users. Right? And so in this particular example I'm showing here, we have four users of various ages and genders. Uh, we have three different advertiser campaigns. One that's run by Zara, which if you don't know, it's a company that makes clothing primarily targeting women. Uh, we have Amazon and uh, Amazon obviously targets everyone because they basically make everything and own everything. And Forever 21, which as the name suggests is targeting young people, right? And so uh, we can think of this as this graph where we have the four users on the left-hand side. And then we have um, the three advertisers on the right-hand side here. And uh, if there's an edge between a user and an advertiser, uh, that means that the advertiser is interested in showing their ad to that particular user. Okay. So uh, at some point in time, a user shows up, right? And so let's say, for example, this 24 year old female shows up. And when they do, we're going to run an auction uh using bids specified by each of the advertisers in order to uh, decide which ad to show to this user okay and this is in fact what happens in practice it's a little more complicated of course because we have to talk about how do you figure out which five ads to show or even how many ads can you fit on the page and so on uh, but for the purpose of this talk i'm just going to assume that we're just choosing a single ad okay? and the campaigns have these different parameters such as, for example, the targeting criteria, that's what we're denoting by these edges, uh, which is just the types of users they're interested in advertising to. But then they typically also have a value per click. Okay? The value per click is something like, um, you know, how much am I willing, willing to pay if a user enters my website? Or it can also be more complicated things, such as if the user makes a purchase. We're going to abstract all that away and just tr treat all of it as a value per click. We're going to assume that we have some good estimates of what those are, um, what the probability that a given user uh, clicks is. Okay. Um, and then finally, and crucially for this talk, advertisers also have budgets. Okay. So typically, not every advertiser, but many advertisers um, have some kind of campaign budget, say how much money do they want to spend across a single day or across a week or something like that. And because this advertiser, say for example, Forever 21, is going to participate in you know several million auctions across uh, 
a, a day or a week, um, this, this budget might actually have a bite, right? And it spans across all the auctions. And so a key part of this talk is gonna be about this fact that we have these budgets that span many different auctions. I'll go into more detail about that in a bit. Um, so just to convince you that this is indeed a real thing, uh, here I'm showing you um, a screenshot of Facebook's advertising interface. I think at this point it's maybe a few years old, but the key thing I wanna point out is that you can see that um, the advertiser gets to specify a daily budget up here, uh, denoted in the red uh, box here, right? And um, they also get to sp specify some kind of uh, value per click, or in this particular example, it's for a video view. So they get to say, I'm willing to pay $4 if a given user watches my whole video. Um, and then given all of this, Basically, what happens is that, say, Facebook or Google then operates a buyer on behalf of this advertiser okay, or a bidder. So that's roughly something that we can think of as follows. So it's shown in this schematic here. Okay? We have the advertiser over here, right? And the advertiser just specifies these parameters, so the budget, the value per click, and the targeting criteria. Then that all goes into this sort of like black box where the publisher operates, uh, whoops, where the publisher operates everything, okay? And the publisher is gonna run a proxy bidder on behalf of the advertiser. And the idea is that this proxy bidder is gonna bid in each of these independent auctions that occur every time a user shows up. Okay. And crucially, this proxy bidder needs to satisfy this budget, which spans across all of the auctions, okay? And so how does this work? Basically, anytime a user shows up, right? we start the auction system and the auction system is just used to decide which ad are we going to show say based on a second price auction okay so the auction system tells the proxy bidder the information about the user say for example uh, their age and whether they're into surfing or something right then the proxy bidder determines do i want to bid and also it determines how much do i want to bid okay and this bid that it determines is going to be somewhat complicated we're going to figure out how to do that later okay the auction system receives all of these bids from all of the proxy bidders, and then some kind of payment and allocation occurs, right? And that's observed by the proxy bidder. At some point, maybe at the end of the day, the advertiser gets to see some kind of report on what happened, like how many um, times were their ads shown, how many times was it clicked on, and stuff like that. Okay? And so the problem that we're interested in is essentially the publisher side problem of how do you design these proxy bidders? And crucially, how do you design them so that they ensure that an advertiser always satisfies their budget while doing something good, something that somehow tries to maximize their utility, uh, given the budgets and their targeting criteria and the bidding from all the other advertisers. Okay. Um, so we want to somehow design good proxy bidders. Okay. And uh, so uh, the way these proxy bidders work is that they use something called pacing. And so pacing is this idea where basically we're going to choose a single scalar value that we're going to scale down all of the valuations of a given advertiser by, and then we're going to use that as their bid in the auction. Okay. So why do we want to do something like this? Uh, so in this example here, I'm going to show you why we need to. Actually. And so what I'm showing here is on the x-axis, we have time. Okay. And on the y-axis, we have um, the price per click um of a bunch of different users that are going to show up okay. and so you can see that um you know if if we say the 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 price that we're willing to pay for a click is this blue line here and we just bid that that's what you would classically do in a second price auction okay what's going to happen is we're going to start winning all of these green dots here okay and at some point we're going to run out of budget say here um, at the vertical line. And what's going to happen is that now we're not going to participate in the rest of the auctions, right? Because now we're out of budget. Um, now, there's an obvious reason why this is not good, right? And the obvious reason is that, for example, this blue dot that's very close to our bid, we paid a high price per click, right? Whereas if we had bid on this other dot that's right after our budget exhaustion, we would have gotten a better price per click. And in fact, we could have bought that and maybe a few, a few other uh, clicks, right? So we didn't spend our budget optimally. 
by bidding sort of our true value in each of the auctions. Okay. Um, so one thing you can do to partially fix your problem, uh, actually, so let me, let me point out another problem first. Another problem is that we ran out of budget early. That might not sound like a problem if you're sort of like just looking at this from a game theoretic perspective, but this turns out to be something that advertisers don't like in practice. Okay? They wanna spend their budget smoothly across the time period uh, that they were active in. Um, so the part about spending it smoothly can be fixed using something called probabilistic pacing. Okay? So in probabilistic pacing, we don't change our bid, um, but we do maintain some kind of biased coin that we get to choose uh, the bias on. And then we flip that coin independently every time an auction happens. And if it comes up heads, we make a bid. Okay. Um, so that's fine. Uh, that'll smooth out our spending. So we won't spend all of our money in like the first half of the day, for example. But it won't fix, fix the second issue where we're still paying too much, right? Like for some of these impressions, we're paying a high price per click when actually uh, we had the opportunity to get much cheaper opportunity, uh, cheaper impressions. Okay. So finally, the way that we're going to actually solve this problem is we're going to do something called multiplicative pacing. Okay. And multiplicative pacing is illustrated here. What we're going to do is we're going to essentially going to take our value per click, or generally our bid for each individual auction, um, which is what's plotted on the x on the y axis because we're plotting price per click. Right. And then we're just gonna shade down all of our bids by the same multiplicative factor. So we're gonna choose some kind of value between zero and one, and we're just gonna scale down all of our values by the same scalar, say 0.5. And then we submit that as our bids in the auction. And then we wanna set that scalar exactly such that we run out of budget at the end of the um, sort of budget period or the, at the end of the, the day, okay? And by, by scaling everything uniformly like this, uh, say by 0.5, what ends up happening is that this essentially ends up acting as a bang per buck threshold. So if we choose a pacing multiplier of 0.5, that essentially ends up meaning that we only want to win auctions where the price is at most one half times our true original valuation. Okay. And by doing that, um, we essentially end up acting like some kind of like knapsack packer, right? Like we just want to increase our bank per buck threshold up and up and up until exactly we hit budget expenditure. And at that point in time, we want to stop. Um, now, of course, you might care about, uh, you know, might have some discrete events, right? Where you have some last uh, auction that pushes you over your budget. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to assume that we can do fractional allocation. Okay. And that's going to allow us to just treat this as a fractional knapsack packing problem. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of like an, um, um, a pictorial explanation of pacing. Okay. Um, as you can see, it also allows us to have sort of smooth expenditure of our budget across time. Um, and so that's a second nice thing. So it achieves that similarly to how probabilistic pacing does it. Finally, why do we study pacing in this paper? It is in fact used in practice. Okay. So pacing, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, a picture from Facebook's guide for advertisers. And in that guide for advertisers, you can see that they're describing how to use what they call discount pacing, but that just means pay multiplicative pacing um, in order to set your bidding uh, optimally. Um, and the fact that they offer a service that'll do it for you. Okay. So both at, at Facebook and I think also at Google nowadays, uh, they can actually, they provide this uh, multiplicative pacing service. Okay. So that's the motivation. Of course, in practice, there's a million complications, right? So we're going to abstract away many of these things. So for example, you know, things change over time. There's unknown user arrivals, uh, complex campaign hierarchies, weird bugs in the system that make everything not really work the way you think it should, and so on and so on. Um, so we're going to consider a more stylized domain okay, where we're just going to focus on sort of the core issue of we have these second price auctions. There are many of them. Uh, buyers wish to bid in all of them, but they want to satisfy budget constraints that span the auctions. Um, so with that, uh, here's the agenda for the rest of the talk. Okay. Uh, so first I'll introduce the model that we're going to be studying. 
Uh, then I'll tell you how second price pacing equilibrium works, which is this uh, solution concept that we introduced. Okay. And I'll tell you a little bit about sort of like exist the fact that these things are guaranteed to exist and some other sort of structural properties that they satisfy. And then sort of the second part of the talk is going to be about some very recent work that I've been doing with one of my PhD students and Shi Chen at Columbia University that is on the problem of can we learn or even compute these second price pacing equilibrium. And then finally, uh, if time permits, although almost certainly we won't get to it, I will also tell you a little bit about what happens if each individual auction is a first price auction rather than a second price auction. Okay. Um, are there any questions before I move on to sort of talking about the model? So. Doesn't look like there's anything in the chat. Okay, cool. Then I will go on to talking about the model. Uh, first, let me just very briefly give a shout out to my co-authors. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about, to some extent, three papers today. Uh, so the impetus for this work is this SPPE paper from Wine 2018, which is now upcoming at op the Operations Research Journal. It was with Vince Conitzer, Eric Sadamkan, and Nico Stiermosis, and there's work that I did partially while I was an intern at Facebook many years ago. We have a follow-up paper st uh, studying the first price setting. Uh, that was at EC19 and upcoming at Management Science. That was also with Vince Conitzer, Eric, and Nico, and additionally with Demalia Panigrahi from Duke and Oka Schreibers, who was also at Facebook. And then finally, in the second part of the talk, as I said, I'm going to talk about very recent results that we just presented at ACM EC21 that are on uh, the computational and complexity properties of this second price pacing equilibrium concept. Okay, and so that's uh, work that was primarily done by my PhD student, Rajitesh Kumar, uh, but in collaboration with me and, and Shi Chen, who is another professor at Columbia University. Okay, so there are many related works uh, that have looked at, like, how do you sort of, like, select a subset of bidders for bidding in these auctions, or how do you modify bids in order to bid in these auctions and so on? Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, instead, I'm just going to sort of like list them here. And if you want to see these, you can uh, send me an email and I'll send you the slide. Okay. So the model is as follows. So we have a set of N bidders, okay? And we have a set of N goods, right? And every bidder is going to have some budget, BI. And furthermore, for every pair of bidder I and good J, um, there's going to be a valuation VIJ, which is how much bidder I values item J. Okay. So mapping this back to the advertising context, bidders are advertisers, goods are impression opportunities. So they're like slots on like uh, a website that we're going to be showing to a user. So the, it's the opportunity to be shown to a particular user at a particular point in time. Okay. Um, and again, you can think of this as a graph where you have goods on one side and bidders on the other side with budgets specified on the bidder nodes and with valuations uh, stated on the edges, right? Another way you can think about it is as a, as a matrix where rows are buyers, uh, columns are items, and each cell just specifies the valuation. Um, now, the actual setting that we're gonna be looking at uh, also needs to specify how do we actually allocate the goods. Okay. And so every good is going to be independently sold in a second price auction. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that every bidder submits a bid, and we look at all of the bids, we give the item to whomever bid the most, right? And we charge them the second highest bid. And if there were only one auction, or just if there were no budgets actually, then um, it would be optimal for every buyer to just submit their true valuation, VIJ, as their bid, BIJ, uh, to auction J, okay? Um, that's no longer gonna be the case in our setting. Okay. Instead, we're gonna assume that in order to deal with the budgets, each bidder is gonna choose a pacing multiplier, which is a value alpha I, that's gonna be between zero and one, okay? And then buyer I, in auction J is going to bid alpha I times VIJ. Okay. So why do they want to do that? Um, well, that's this um, 
fact that the pacing multiplier basically specifies their banker buck threshold, right? Because it's still going to be a second price function. Yeah. And a given bidder is going to experience an, a utility that's equal to the total value that they derive from the goods that they get minus the total costs, right? Provided that the budget constraint is satisfied. If the budget constraint is not satisfied, we're just going to say they get negative infinity utility because we're required to satisfy the budgets. Okay. So with that, uh, let's look at a brief example. Okay. So in this example, uh, we have buyer one and we have buyer two. And you see that we have on the first good, we have that buyer one has value one. And we have that buyer two has value 0.5. And on the second good, we have that buyer one has value 0.5 and buyer two has value 0.125. Right? So let's say we don't do any pacing or equivalently, we set both pacing multipliers to one. Okay, so that's the uh, solution that I'm now showing in the middle here. Okay, what's going to happen is that buyer one is going to win both items, right? They submit the highest good or the highest bid on each of the two goods. And for each of them, they pay the second highest bid, which is the bid submitted to buy, by buyer two, which is 0.5 and 0.125, right? Now, uh, in the rightmost column here is the expenditure, right? And what you see is that buyer ones end up spending too much, right? So they run out of budget. So they don't want that. A second potential solution that also does not work is let's say we just try to scale down buyer ones, um, uh, pacing multiplier by a large amount. Let's say we put it to 0.4. That makes it low enough that they only win the second good, right? Um, and then buyer two wins the first good. And the spends are then 0.125 and 0.4. But this solution is also not good, right? Because buyer one is not happy here. Like they actually would have liked to buy some of the first item in this case, right? Um, and so what this means is that essentially we're gonna need to choose these pacing multipliers very carefully uh, so that potentially causing ties where we fractionally allocate part of a good to buyer one and to buyer two, right? But as our next show, it turns out that if you're able to do fractional allocation, it is in fact the case that every bidder in this setting has a best response that corresponds to pacing. Okay. Um, and so what I mean by that, well, let's imagine that we allow a given bidder, once we fixed all the other bids, we allow them to bid anything they want, right? We don't restrict them uh, to these uh, pacing multiplier based bits, alpha i times vij, we just let them bid whatever they want on each item. Well, if they do that, it turns out they can do no better than by just picking the optimal pacing multiplier. Okay. As long as we allow them to fractionally choose or, or choose a fractional amount of any item that's like that they're tied uh, with another bidder with. Okay. And the issue, intuition for this I gave already. Okay. The intuition is that. If you just plot uh, the bang per buck on the y axis and you sort of have your items across time on the x axis, right? You can just think of yourself as a fractional knapsack packer. And so you want to, like I showed before, you want to sort of like choose this optimal threshold on your bang per buck where you want everything below that threshold and you don't want to win stuff above it, even though you technically would be getting positive utility because you're out of budget. Um, so this is shown rigorously in the wine 2018 paper. Um, and because of this, the equilibrium concept that we'll focus on is what's called a pacing equilibrium, which is a notion that we introduced in this paper. Okay. So a pacing equilibrium is a set of pacing multipliers, right? So an alpha I between zero and one for every buyer, okay? such that we satisfy one of the following two conditions. The first condition, is that uh, the buyer spends less than or equal to their budget and their pacing multiplier is one, right? So if I'm bidding my true valuation in every auction and I'm not spending my budget, then by the standard analysis of second price auctions, I'm happy, right? Because my budget doesn't matter. The more interesting case is the second solution that we allow is that the buyer uh, spends their budget exactly, in which case their pacing multiplier may be strictly less than one. Okay. And so the second case is when the budget does kick in, if alpha i is strictly less than one, what that means is the buyer needed to be paced, but in that case, uh, they need to be spending their whole budget. Okay. 
And so it turns out that if these two properties are satisfied, uh, you get, um, this is what we call a pacing equilibrium, but it also turns out to correspond to a pure strategy Nash equilibrium in a certain sense. Okay. Now there is one caveat to this, which is that we have to deal with ties. Okay. So because of how we're gonna be choosing these pacing multipliers, we are almost certainly going to cause ties to happen because each buyer wants to exactly, exactly exhaust their budget if their pacing multiplier is less than one. Okay. We're going to assume that the system uh, is allowed to choose any fractional allocation and in particular it can choose one in an attempt to satisfy the budgets. Right? Okay. And so this is the solution concept. And if we go back to the example that I was showing before, okay, the pacing equilibrium looks as follows. We want to scale down um, buyer one by a, a pacing multiplier of 0.5. Okay. That's going to cost them to win the second good. And it's going to cost them to be tied on the first good. Okay. And then we need to choose because buyer one is paid is, is paced. We need to choose the fraction that they win such that they spend their remaining budget, given the amount that they spend on good two. Okay. And that's achieved by setting the amount that they win on the first good to three fourths. And then the other buyer wins one fourth the remaining amount. Okay. Um, okay. So the first result that I already kind of mentioned is that if you have such a pacing equilibrium, okay, um, then for every uh, bidder I, alpha I corresponds to a best response. Okay. Um, and so the implication of this is that even though we came up with this solution concept that doesn't have anything to do with best responses, right? All we're asking is that we're allocating according to second price auctions and we just satisfy either one of these two conditions, no pacing or pace and spend the budget, right? Um, but if we find a set of alpha i's along with uh, fractional allocations xij such that these uh, conditions are satisfied, then we're playing a pure Nash equilibrium in a certain sense, okay? Now, again, there is this fractional allocation to deal with, but nonetheless, this turns out to have a pure Nash equilibrium interpretation. Okay, so that's nice. Like now we have this solution concept that kind of tells us if we are Facebook with Google and we're trying to construct these proxy bidders that are trying to choose these alpha I's so as to exactly preserve uh, my budget, uh, in the sense of satisfying these complementarity conditions, um, then it's sort of well formed. Like there is a so there is uh, a sense in which if everyone is doing this and they achieve this, then everyone is happy because everyone is playing a Nash equilibrium. Okay. But of course, that still begs the question of does this thing exist? Right? And so it turns out uh, that it does. Okay. Um, and the way to show it is by relying on sort of like a famous old uh, fixed point theorem of De Bruyne, Flixberg, and Fun, which says that a game with continuous strategy spaces has a pure Nash, a pure strategy Nash equilibrium if every buyer has a compact and convex, strat convex strategy space. Okay? And the utility of every buyer is continuous in the joint set of strategies across all the players. And finally, the utility must be quasi-concave in my own strategy choice when fixing the bids of every other buyer. Okay. So this is a famous fixed point theorem that allows you to prove the existence of pure strategy and Nash equilibrium. And indeed, we do satisfy compact and convex strategy spaces, right? Like my strategy space is just to choose um, an alpha I that's between zero and one. There's this fractional part, but we'll get rid of that in a second. Right? Um, it turns out quasi-concavity is also fine. But one part that's not fine is that our game is not continuous, right? Um, both because of allocations and because of budgets. Because basically, I don't start winning a good until I tie the highest bid exactly. And if I exceed that bid at all, then I'm forced to win the entirety of the good. Right? So we have these discrete jumps in the utilities. Um, the second issue is that it's also not continuous in the sense that if I exceed my budget, I go from some positive utility to negative infinity, right? So these two things are issues. And so the way that we prove existence nonetheless uh, is by sort of like smoothing out the pacing game, okay? And the core idea of this is to construct a new sort of like 
second price esque auction setting where everything is continuous in the uh, pacing multiplier alpha i. Okay. Um, so I think I'll skip going over each of these uh, ideas that are used in this in smoothing it. But basically, I'll just mention briefly like one, we make it uh, not quite a second price auction in the sense that basically we insert sort of an epsilon band around the highest bidder, where as long as anyone is within that epsilon band, they sort of like win a fractional amount where if they're tied with the highest bid, then it's split 50 50 and they get nothing if they're exactly at the uh, end point uh, of the epsilon band below the highest bid. Okay, and then they sort of like continuously uh, gain as they move up that band. Um, and secondly, we also do pricing um, in a similar way. Okay. Um, there's a number of other things we also need to insert. So we construct a smooth approximation to the budget violation penalty. That's never negative infinity, but in, that instead increases continuously but rapidly as you exceed your budget. Okay. Um, and then you insert a few other of these kind of smoothing ideas. And it turns out that if you do this right, then you get a new game that is not quite the same as the original one, but it's now a game where you only care about every buyer choosing a pacing multiplier because we specified the tie breaking by inserting these epsilon bands that smoothly allocate uh, to the highest bidder and anyone that's within this epsilon band of them. Okay. So now the strategy space is just the pacing multipliers. Um, and then by doing all the smoothing, it turns out we can make the utility functions continuous. Okay. And so in this smooth game, um, where we can say epsilon is sort of the amount of smoothing that we're applying, we can apply this to bro Glicksburg, uh, fun uh, fixed point theorem. And then the final step of this proof is basically just to take the limit point as the smoothing goes to zero and prove that if you take the limit of the resulting equilibria, um, then you get something that corresponds to an equilibrium in the original game. Okay. Um, so that proves that there is an exist that there always exists one of these second price pacing equilibria. So that's nice. Um, there are some other nice properties of these second price pacing equilibria. One of them is that they turn out to be uh, related to market equilibrium. Okay, so in a market equilibrium, in a Fisher market in particular, you have n buyers and m items. And every buyer has a linear utility bij for buy, uh, uh, for item I, uh, j, and every buyer has some budget bi. Okay. And um, then in a market equilibrium, you're trying to choose prices along with allocations so that the market clears, uh, meaning that every item is allocated exactly uh, at its supply. And you wanna pick that in a way where given the prices, every buyer is getting an optimal um, bundle under those prices given their utilities and their budget, okay? Now, classically, when you looked at what the optimal bundle looks like in a market equilibrium, you usually define it as the buyer is gonna maximize their utility over the set of all budget feasible bundles given the current prices that you've set. Okay? But they would classically ignore the supply constraints of the items when computing their uh, demands. Okay? If you define a new kind of utility function where the buyers are supply aware when they compute their demand, meaning that they now maximize their quasi-linear utility, but over the set of budget feasible allocations, but also taking into account the supply of the items, so this is a new or a different version of the classical market equilibrium for a Fisher market. Okay. And if you change the utilities to be like this and the demand to be like this, it turns out that SPPE uh, corresponds to a refinement of the set of all supply aware market equilibrium. Okay. And by our existence result, that also means that such a refinement always exists. Um, so let me summarize a little bit on uh, second price pacing equilibrium. Right? So, what have we talked about so far? So second price pacing equilibria are a way to control budgets. Practically speaking, uh, that's usually done uh, using some kind of adaptive control algorithm that scales up the pacing multiplier over time, right? So we completely ignore time and we just kind of looked at the hindsight problem, if you will, of saying, what is the right set of pacing multipliers for everyone if we had known what the market was gonna look like, okay? And um, in this pacing equilibrium, um, we said that every buyer must satisfy their budget, right? And crucially, they must satisfy this no unnecessary pacing condition 
where we only allow their pacing multiplier to be strictly less than one if they are exhausting their budget. Then we saw that pure Nash equilibria of this pacing game, uh, or there, there exists a pure Nash equilibrium interpretation of this second price pacing equilibrium, okay, in the sense that any second price pacing equilibrium also corresponds to a pure Nash equilibrium, even if you allow buyers to more generally submit whatever bits they want. Okay. And finally, we saw that it has a relationship to market equilibria, albeit under this like slightly different uh, variation than the classical version where we require each buyer to be supply aware. Okay. So these are all sort of nice properties of these second price pacing equilibria that are trying to capture a real world phenomenon, right? Like it's guaranteed to exist, it has these nice sort of like pure Nash equilibrium properties, um, and it has some relationship to market equilibrium. Okay. So those are good things. Unfortunately, there are also some bad things. Okay. So one of them is that um, in certain instances, it turns out that there are multiple equilibria. So if you're familiar with sort of like Nash equilibrium in general, this is often sort of a criticism of Nash equilibrium in general sum game. You have this sort of equilibrium selection problem. Um, and in second price pacing equilibrium, this turns out to be particularly annoying because not only do you now worry about whether everyone else is playing the same equilibrium, like maybe you could fix that by having some kind of iterative method and you're converging together, but also different equilibria can have wildly different properties, both in terms of how well treated each of the bidders are and in terms of the revenue generated for the platform. Okay. And so uh, in this example here, I'm just showing one example of that. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip going over all the details. But basically what ends up happening in this uh, problem instance is that we have three buyers and four goods, and there turn out to be two equilibria, one of which generates a revenue of 102 for the uh, seller, and one of which generates a revenue of three, right? So there can be huge variation in how nice these equilibria are, uh, both from the buyer and from the seller perspective. Um, you can also, if you look up the paper, see instances of multiplicity uh, that have, for example, huge differences in the welfare achieved by the buyers. We also have some examples showing that um, even disregarding multiplicity, the equilibria can sort of change drastically, even with small epsilon perturbations to the budgets of the buyers. Okay, so these are sort of like multiplicity and sensitivity issues. These weren't so great. Um, but I mean, you know, let's carry on because these things are actually done in practice. So we need to understand them, right? And in fact, you know, since we're in a computer science department, a really natural question is, well, if we're going to be running these control algorithms that are going to be trying to compute these sort of like pacing equilibria, which essentially is the same as saying the control algorithms converged and everyone was sort of happy in hindsight, okay? A really sensible question that we might ask ourselves is, well, what actually happens when every buyer uses pacing simultaneously. Like, is it even possible to compute these things? Is it possible to learn them um, with some kind of adaptive control algorithm, such as the ones that are used in practice, right? Um, and so, you know, there were some initially positive thoughts about this. Okay? So all the way back in 2007, uh, Borgs, Chase, Imorlika, Jain, Isasami, and Madian uh, gave a Tatolman style dynamics for pacing Okay, where they showed that if every individual auction is a first price auction, not a second price auction, okay, then there's sort of an efficient Tatoman style dynamics where buyers just kind of scale up and down their uh, pacing multiplier over time as they spend too much or too little uh, across every iteration of the algorithm. Okay, that will efficiently converge to the right pacing multipliers. Okay, so that was the first price setting. In that paper from 2007, they also conjectured that a similar convergence would be possible for the second price setting. Okay, so where every auction uses second price rather than first price. Okay. Um, 12 years later, Balsero and Gore in their paper study a repeated auction setting for budget constrained buyers. Okay. And what they show in that paper is first that it is optimal to use pacing uh, for each individual buyer. Uh, both when the input that they observe is stochastic or adversarial, okay? And secondly, they also show that if every buyer uses optimal pacing-based strategies, okay, then the dynamics converge efficiently to a pacing equilibrium 
when everybody's valuations are independently distributed and satisfy a certain uh, strong monotonicity condition, which I will say caveat is hard to verify. So it's un unclear what that tells you about the general pace and equilibrium setting if you're trying to run sort of like online uh, second price auctions. Okay. So these are some existing results that are sort of in the positive direction. And so in this recent um, EC21 paper um, by my student Rajitesh, me and uh, Shi Chen, uh, we study uh, the actual sort of like complexity of computing these pacing equilibrium. Okay. And in order to study that, we introduce a notion of an approximate pacing equilibrium. And so in the approximate pacing equilibrium, all we do is we say, well, we're no longer going to require that it's a second price auction. Instead, we're just going to require that if a bidder is winning any amount of good J, okay, if buyer I is winning some of good J, then their bid better be within a one minus delta fraction of the highest other bid. Okay, so this function HJ of the vector alpha just returns the highest bid. And we're saying that in a multiplicative sense, if you're going to be winning any of good J, you need to be within a one minus delta fraction of the highest bid. Okay. So we relax the sort of second price allocation rule. Secondly, we also relax the not too much the unnecessary pacing condition. Okay. So remember that we said that a buyer, if their pacing multiplier is strictly less than one, then they need to be spending their budget exactly. Okay. And otherwise, their pacing multiplier needs to be one. So we relax that condition as well. And this is the second approximation parameter that we introduce. Okay. So we say that the expenditure of a buyer, if it is strictly less than one minus gamma, okay, um, times their budget, then their pacing multiplier needs to be almost one. And in particular, it needs to be at least one minus gamma. And so we say that this is a delta gamma approximate pacing equilibrium. Okay. And this, the approximation here is again, one, we only sort of like nearly do sort of like allocation to only the highest bid. And secondly, we sort of only nearly do this no unnecessary pacing condition. And what we show in the paper is the following theorem, which is a negative theorem. So it turns out that um, it is, in fact, PPAD hard to compute these pacing equilibria. Okay? And uh, in particular, we show that for any constant C greater than zero, computing a delta gamma approximate equilibrium, pacing equilibrium, is PPAD hard. Okay? For delta and gamma equal to one over n to the power of C. So we cannot hope to sort of like get arbitrarily close to a pacing equilibrium efficiently. Secondly, we also show that um, the converse problem, or sort of the converse direction, we show that computing an exact pacing equilibrium, that problem is contained in the problem uh, in the PPAD class. Okay. Um, so if you're not familiar with PPAD, I guess I, I probably should have gone over that. So PPAD is this class of problems that are sort of like, they're kind of like NP-complete problems, but they have this peculiar property that uh, there, there's the types of problems where a solution always exists. Okay? And so in NP-complete problems, it's kind of like, is there a valid assignment to this satisfiability problem, right? And you're asking, does it even exist? In PPAD-complete uh, problems, we always have a solution. Like, for example, I already showed you that we proved that these second price pacing equilibria always exist, right? Um, sort of the canonical problem uh, in PPAD is the Nash equilibrium problem in two-player general sum games. Okay? So that's sort of the most famous uh, PPAD complete problem. And so to put things in sort of simpler terms, what we show in this paper is that computing pacing equilibrium is as hard as computing Nash equilibria of bimatrix games, or for example, finding a Brouwer fixed point, if you're familiar with that. Okay? And these are problems that have eluded efficient algorithms for 30 years or something like that, right? Um, although we technically don't know if PPAD is a class of hard problems. Or not. Okay, so that's sort of the complexity statement. Maybe I'll stop and ask if anyone has any questions. Uh, I don't see any in the chat. All right, uh, cool. 
So I guess let me move on to what does this tell us? Okay, so uh, we showed this PPAD uh, completeness result. So under the assumption that PPAD hard problems are not efficiently solvable, we get the following. Okay, first, uh, in fact, in my 2018 paper, which the first half of the presentation was based on, we had conjectured that computing second price pacing equilibria is a PPAD complete problem. Okay, so this EC21 paper closes that open question and shows that that conjecture was indeed true. Okay. Secondly, I told you about these sort of like positive results for the first price setting in this Borg et al. paper from 2007, right? So what I said was they give an efficient atonement style dynamics for converging to a pacing equilibrium when we're dealing with the first price setting. Okay. And they had conjectured that there was a similarly efficient uh, convergence for the second price setting. Our result disproves that con con conjecture. Okay, so our result shows that dynamics cannot be converging efficiently for second price options. If they were to converge, it would necessarily have to be at an inefficient rate. Okay. Uh, furthermore, I, I told you about this Balsera and Gore paper where they study this repeated auction setting with bucket constrained buyers, right? And they showed optimality of pacing, they showed some convergence results under the assumption that values for buyers are independently distributed. Okay. So in their setting, we're in an online setting and at every time step, a random item is drawn and every buyer is independently drawing their valuation for that item, okay. which obviously is a strong assumption. In practice, that's not true if you're in an internet type setting, for example, because uh, Amazon's valuation and Forever 21's valuation is correlated. Our um, second price pacing model admits a stochastic interpretation, okay? And with that stochastic interpretation, um, we show essentially that um, this optimal bidding strategy based on adaptive pacing cannot converge efficiently if values are correlated, okay? So this result for the independently distributed setting of Balsero and Gore um, cannot generalize to the completely general setting with correlated valuations. I will say they had one more assumption beyond just independence, which is this strong monotonistic condition. So I guess we technically don't know if it even generalizes to the uh, independent values, but without this assumption. But we know that now by our result, it cannot extend beyond that. There's no way that it can converge uh, for general correlating ratios. Okay. Um, there are also some other papers uh, that have looked at various um, sort of pacing equipment based solution concepts. And our result uh, can also be applied to all of these other settings and thereby shows that none of these uh, solution concepts are efficiently computable in general. Okay. Um, and I'll just briefly mention the reason that our results generalizes like that is because we introduced these approximation notions. Okay. So because it's hard even to find an approximate pacing equilibrium that allows us to capture some of these other settings that are not looking at exactly the same thing as us. Okay, so these are not exactly the same setting, but because we allow this relaxed notion, we can still make claims about them. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm pretty close to running out of time. So maybe I'll just extremely briefly tell you about the proof uh, ideas. Okay. So there's two main results in this new EC21 paper. One is PPAD hardness. The other is PPAD containment. So all of these, in my opinion, quite important implications about conjectures from many years ago and so on, are really implied by the PPAD hardness result. Okay. Unfortunately, the PPAD hardness result is basically just from a disgusting proof about reducing um, the problem of computing Nash equilibria in two-player zero one cost by matrix games to our uh, pacing problem. Okay. So there's not that much intuition to give. And for that reason, even if I had the time, it's not the, the most sort of like interesting proof. It's really just a lot of technical details in order to deal with this uh, gnarly reduction, okay? But this is really the most important result. On the other hand, the PPAD containment result is actually quite cute in the proof. Um, so I wanna maybe very briefly uh, mention that that proof is based on Sperner's lemma. Um, so if you're familiar with Sperner's lemma from you know, sort of like your standard algorithmic game theory class, essentially Sperner's lemma says that if you have a triangle, 
such as this triangle over here, where we have A, B, and C as the vertices, okay? And you take any triangulation of that triangle into smaller sub-triangles, okay? Then uh, you have the following property. Let's say that we associate A with the label one, B with the label two, and C with the label three, okay? And then um, we number each of the vertices between one and one and three, either one or three. Um, and then between the vertices one and two, we, we uh, number everything in between either one or two arbitrarily. And between the vertices two and three, or B and C, we number everything arbitrarily either three or two. Okay. Then any assignment of values uh, to the vertices um, within the triangle guarantees that there must exist some uh, triangle that contains all three labels. Okay, and so in the example that I'm giving here, that is this uh, triangle in red, you see that this triangle has one, two, and three as its corners. Okay, so this is Sperner's lemma, and it turns out to be very useful um, for proving sort of like containment in PPAD for many problems. Okay. Um, and in particular, in our case, we construct again, this kind of smooth tie-breaking rule from before, Okay, so that uh, buyers are only choosing pacing multipliers. Okay, and then we come up with a way of associating uh, with every point in the triangle uh, a set of pacing multipliers. Okay, and the high level idea is that we say that A corresponds to the uh, vector 1, 0, 0, where only uh, buyer 1 has a non zero pacing multiplier. B is the 0, 1, 0 vector, where only buyer 2 has a non zero pacing multiplier. And C is the 0, 0, 1 vector where only buyer 3 has a non zero pacing multiplier. Okay. Then we label everything according to this Sperner labeling scheme. Okay. And that gives us a bunch of points in the uh, probability simplex, right? That doesn't actually mean they correspond to pacing multipliers yet. And then what we do is for every vertex, the way we assign the label is as follows. So we say that every buyer is going to have a pacing multiplier at a given vertex beta that is going to be equal to T times beta I, where T is going to be a scalar. Okay. Then we increase T gradually and tell each buyer that they need to say stop if their budget constraint becomes tight or their pacing multiplier reaches one. Okay. And then we label beta, the, the vertex that we're looking at, with that particular index. Okay, so with the buyer that said stop. Okay. And if you label all of the vertices this way, it's not hard to convince yourself that uh, on the ed along the edges, because buyer three has a pacing multiplier of zero, T times zero is still zero. So it's always going to be buyer one or two that says stop along this edge. It's always going to be buyer two or three along this edge, and it's always going to be buyer three or one along this edge. Okay. And then basically by doing this, eventually we guarantee that there must be a point inside of this triangulation such that we have a uh, sub uh, subsimplex where every buyer says stop at one of the corners. And now finding such a triangle, we can use that to construct an approximate pacing rule. So that's the very high level idea. I'm running out of time, so I'll just wrap that up with that. Okay. Um, to get PBAD membership of exact equilibria, we need to furthermore do some rounding and some LP-based arguments, okay? But I'll skip those. And instead, I'll just wrap up. Okay? So I told you about second price pacing equilibria, and they're a thing that is used in these large-scale auction settings in practice, okay? And we showed that they always exist. They have a pure Nash equilibrium interpretation. They have a relationship to market equilibria, uh, but unfortunately, they turn out to not be unique, and often there's multiplicity and potentially big sort of like uh, revenue differences and stuff like that, stuff like that. Um, and finally, I told you about how um, in general, these things are PPAD hard to compute. Okay? In fact, they're PPAD complete. Okay? Uh, in the paper, we have some more properties that I won't spend time on. Instead, I'll just wrap up the talk and say uh, thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm happy to, to take any questions. I'm not sure how this 
panel setup works. Um, but uh, thank you. If people just want to put any questions into the chat, that would probably be the easiest. All right. I, you know, I was, personally, I was kind of wondering uh, where are you going next with this work? Um, that's a good question. So, you know, so, so one thing that's kind of interesting is this fact that like, so, so, you know, the most recent result that I talked about was this PPAD completeness result, right? Which basically shows that like, in general, we can't really hope to converge to these efficiently. At the same time, there are settings, uh, where you can, like, for example, when the values were independently sampled, like I was saying, and you have these strong monotonicity conditions. And so I'm very interested in what is the, um, what is the sort of boundary of tractability here, right? Like, so, so somehow it's like, if we have general correlated valuations um, for the buyers, then it's not tractable. But if somehow if we have independent valuations drawn at every time step, which is a strong assumption, but nonetheless, then it seems to be tractable. And so it'd be nice to understand where is the actual boundary here? Uh, is there some kind of mixed, slightly correlated, but not too correlated setting that we can handle, for example? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's been a couple of questions, so I'll just relay them to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so beyond the examples of Google and Facebook, what other markets slash companies who host auctions may find use from this idea of pacing? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to give you a lame answer and be like Twitter <laughs> and um, I don't know, TikTok, Snapchat, Baidu, you know, so, so all these other companies that also um do the same thing so obviously they would benefit from it but you're probably looking for a more interesting question or sorry interesting answer so to speak um so one thing that this can be, so because this can be related to market equilibria um you can also try to relate this to sort of like non real money settings. Okay. So in my setting, I was sort of saying that, um, you know, buyer utilities, let's see if I can find the slide. Uh, right. So we have this connection to market equilibrium and buyer utilities have sort of like, you know, the value that you get minus the price that you pay. Um, if you just get rid of this price that you pay condition, things still work actually. And so then you would get a solution concept that's sort of more like a way of adaptively allocating items in a non-monetary setting, but where maybe you want to give people sort of like a fixed amount of credit that they're able to use. And that can be used to do some kind of fair assignment over time, for example. Um, I don't know about EVE Online because I don't know that game very well. I know it's a very intricate MMO with a very intricate economy, um, but I don't know if there would be a good application there. And Lirong asked, uh, thanks so much for, for said, thanks so much for great talking. Say a few words about the welfare slash revenue guarantee, e.g. any known competitive ratios. Um, So that's a good question. Um, so it depends on what you mean by guarantee here, I guess, because it depends on what you want to relate it to. By the way, I, I do see the chat now, uh, now that I'm not screen sharing anymore. Um, so, you know, it's tricky because like I was saying, um, we have this multiplicity issue where you can have very high revenue and very small revenue, right? And so it's un so I guess it depends on what you mean by say revenue. So let's just focus on revenue rather than welfare just to pick something. Um, do, do you have sort of a specific kind of guarantee in mind? Um, because we don't have a bound on sort of like how much it can change in terms of sensitivity and stuff like that. Essentially, because of this multiplicity issue. Okay. Cool. 
and welfare has the same issues. So I said I focus I put revenue here, uh, but you can come up with similar issues for welfare. Welfare is a little bit funny in our setting though because, you know, if you're measuring standard social welfare for a buyer whose like valuation sums to one thousand but their budget is one dollar, then is it really meaningful to give them a lot of allocation so that they're like, you know, sort of like nominal social welfare is high? Probably not. And so welfare is a little bit tricky in our setting, but that's kind of a separate discussion. You, no matter how you define it, you, more or less, I think you're going to have potentially these big swings. All right, I guess uh, no more questions. I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Taking the time to give us a great talk. It's really good. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone for inviting me. Um, hope to see you around at conferences sometime in the future or soon at UNI.